Kia ora and welcome. This is a New Zealand wine growers presentation for New Zealand Wine Week. My name is Cameron Douglas and I am a master sommelier. I live and work in New Zealand. I'm sitting here in my home in Auckland as well and uh, it's great to have you here. My role in the hospitality and wine sector in New Zealand is varied and I just want to give you a brief overview about that just for one minute so you know who's sitting in front of you chatting today. Uh, as I said I'm a master sommelier but I'm also an educator, I am a wine writer, I write for two major magazines in New Zealand which is called Mind Food and The Shout. There's a subsidiary magazine called The World of Wine which I publish twice a year. I'm an educator at a university. Uh, in the beverage program, I write wine lists and I have a wine review website called camdouglasms.com, camdouglasms.com. So it keeps me pretty busy. I'm actually sitting here in West Auckland and West Auckland is a pretty famous area historically because it's really where the first major hub of wine production in New Zealand started. So over that way about 20 kilometres is Kumu River. You might have heard of that and over behind me about 30 kilometres away is Waiheke Island. So just to give you a perspective of where I'm sitting. The map behind me on the wall is going to come into play shortly but I've also got two large maps that I want to show you. But before we sort of get started in talking about New Zealand's sub-regions and Pinot Noir and the wines that I'll be tasting with you today, I just thought I'd give you a few sort of factual overview comments so that you get a perspective, a sense of where New Zealand is today, yeah, in 20, late 2021, early 2022. So we have 10 wine regions. With those wine regions, with the exception of one, every single wine region has a minimum of three sub-regions that are sort of domiciled around that area that feed into the fabric of the New Zealand wine story and of course Pinot Noir. Every single wine region in New Zealand grows Pinot Noir, some a lot better than others. And today's tastings, we're gonna start in Hawke's Bay and move our way south. Auckland does grow Pinot Noir, but there are literally only two producers that I'm aware of. So we're gonna start in Hawke's Bay. Gisborne does grow Pinot Noir as well. But the real story today begins uh, in the middle of the North Island on the East Coast. We have what's called a geographical indicator system in New Zealand. And currently there are 21 GIs. We're looking to have a 22nd one uh, come into play shortly. Of those 21 GIs, three of them are in what we call perpetuity, and that is the GI of New Zealand itself, the GI of North Island, and the GI of the South Island. The one that is um, being accepted into the system but not yet registered as a GI is a subregion that I'll be talking about today, and that is Bannockburn, and that is just been accepted in late 2021 into the GI um, system for rationalization and acceptance and registration. Okay, we have 731 wineries as of the New Zealand Wine Growers Annual Report 2021. 96% of those wineries are certified sustainable, which is a very important component for exports around the world but it's also a strong message about the New Zealand movement towards sustainability and the custodial approach that our wine companies are now putting into place. We have 732 growers. So now you know the size and the shape, we're a small wine industry here. 40,000 hectares are dedicated to grape growing and wine production, which is an increase on the previous years. And of those 40,000 hectares, 14.3%, quite exacting number, are dedicated to Pinot Noir. That's a little under 6,000 hectares, essentially. 
2021 was a difficult year in terms of the volume of production for New Zealand, but the quality was very, very high. But just to give you a perspective in terms of what that challenge was, is that Pinot Noir is essentially, we produce 64% of what we would normally produce for Pinot Noir in 2021. So that's quite a dramatic drop on 2020. Recent vintages that are great for New Zealand Pinot Noir, 13, 14, 18 in some places, 19, 20, and of course, 21. It's too soon to talk about 2022 vintage, so we'll move on from there quite quickly. All right. I'll keep going for a minute, and then we're going to segue into what we're here to talk about. Of those 731 wine brands that I mentioned, 43 of them have full organic or biodynamic status. So certified BioGro or Demeter certification. 21 more of those are partially organic or biodynamic in terms of their certification or resourcing of fruit. 102 growers of grapes in New Zealand are certified organic. So in, in terms of that certification, in terms of that representation, this is a growing number historically. So again, that movement into the custodial, looking after the land below the ground, on the ground, above the ground is very, very important to the New Zealand wine story, the New Zealand wine sector. And I guess you who are encountering a lot of these wines, in addition to what, you know, is the backbone of the wine industry of New Zealand, you know, the white wine that I'm talking about, but Pinot Noir is a growing force of quality in New Zealand. Right. Soils. New Zealand soils are essentially between sort of 50 and 350 million years old, give or take, um, you know, a million years here and there. And what that means is that uh, geologically speaking, we're quite young, but not so young that it doesn't have a dramatic impact on our outcomes in terms of great varieties and wines that we produce, whether they're still or sparkling or fortified. So I want to show you a couple of maps quickly just to give you sort of size and shape and, and what those weather patterns are. And then we can talk about Hawke's Bay and our first pin and one. So time for the hat off. And I just want to show you these maps here. Hopefully you can see that okay. This is the North Island of New Zealand. And even if you paused and zoomed in on this, you can see there's a significant amount of detail in, in our maps. It takes probably seven hours to drive from the top of the North Island to our capital Wellington here. But our viticulture is, viticulture is largely on the Eastern side. And the first place that we're gonna to visit today is Hawke's Bay. And you can see how sort of concave this piece of land is here. All of the prevailing weather that comes into New Zealand comes in on the western side, sometimes on the eastern side, it depends if we get a cyclone or not, but Hawke's Bay is largely sheltered. Uh, we have our Nelson region here, we're going to visit here a little bit later on, and you'll see that there is this sort of um, conical um, ocean influence here prevailing weather this way and several mountain ranges that create this rain shadow effect for the top of the South Island and largely down the backbone of the South Island as well. So anything that's planted on the Eastern side has this uh, rain shadow effect and it's quite dry. As the soils um, you encounter head southward, what we'll actually find is that the soils do get a little bit older. But in general terms, and this is a very broad general term before we sort of focus in on subregions, is that there are two types of geographical periods in history, as in the millions of years old. And I have to put my glasses on to read this so I can pronounce it properly. And these are called the Cenozoic and the Cretaceous periods. And that is essentially throughout New Zealand. So if you looked up Cenozoic and Cretaceous, you'll find that essentially, and, and again, broadly speaking, we're in that sort of 50 to 350 million year old soil mapping 
understanding. I hope that makes sense for you. For regions like Nelson, they also have this Paleozoic, which is kind of like a young Cretaceous um, period, Paleozoic. Um, and then when you get to the Nelson, sort of, and sorry, the Marlborough area moving south, the bedrock of New Zealand, which is called Grey Wacky, starts to be a significant influence on um, the soils that are clearly the bedrock, but some that come to the surface. Um, down in central Otago, moving on from there in the last one, they, they also have what is called the Carboniferous, the Carboniferous um, Age of Soils as well. So what this means is that, yes, we're geologically quite young, but you know, 350 million years is still 350 million years. The incidence of clay is significant in the North Island, especially Northland, Auckland, Gisborne, parts of Hawke's Bay. And then we start to get these seams of limestone gravel deposits. We can get quite silty soil, say in the wider Rapa area, when I start talking about those mines. And when we get to Marlborough in particular and moving south, all of these gravels start to become part of the soil profile. And then suddenly limestone props up again in Canterbury and North Canterbury especially. And then we move on to Otago, which is the northern part of Otago, Waitaki Valley, if you know that one, and then central Otago with its major subregions. And we're visiting Bannockburn there. Finally, and just, just a comment on climate change, because it's always part of the discussion around the wine table, the wine tasting table, or often is. And the answer for New Zealand is yes, we are starting to see the effects of climate change on us. And what that delivers to us is weather extremes. So a weather bomb of rain or um, a, a sudden frost. So things are changing, but our winemakers are adapting to that through uh, canopy management, through the, um, the planning, if you like, of clone, clonal material, rootstock material, to counter the effects of some of these um, in order to prepare for the future. And again, that's that, that's that custodial word that I was using before. So rootstocks, uh, clones, canopy management, vineyard management, crystal ball gazing, predicting, but it is a slow change as well. You know, it's not like things are gonna to happen tomorrow, but we know things are happening and things are changing. All right, time to visit our first wine region. And this is Hawke's Bay. And I wanna show you the bottle I'm gonna pour from. This is Timata Estate and it's called Alma. And this is named after a historical uh, event, the um, Alma War. Um, and it's in recognition of that. However, um, what are the subsoils of the subregion of um, where this wine is grown? So first of all, Hawke's Bay, it is coastal as I showed you on that map before. And so the soil profile is what we call marine gravels, sandy silts, there's sand stone here, there's silty stones, there's a lot of glacial effect from um, um, historical glacial effect, if you like. And ultimately where a lot of the fruit is grown to make wine is gravel based or free draining based. So up to 62% of the vineyard sites in Hawke's Bay, including the Woodthorpe terraced area where this wine comes from has this gravel moraine um, soil makeup. If we zoomed in on the Woodthorpe terraces where this wine comes from, um, we've got sandy loam over gravel soils. The other thing that is an influence on the subregion is the tuta, Tutai Kauri, Tutai Kut, sorry, let me pronounce that again. See, this is my Tutareo. Um, Tutai Kuri River. And this river, it's quite a braided river. It's not wide, but it's a braided river. And it's carved out this terrace where um, this Woodthorpe vineyard is over millennia. It has a moderating effect, but it's also not too far from the coast that the coastal influences 
also moderate the climate. I don't think salty air really reaches that far inland, but it's an important sort of um, component of what this wine is all about to take into account. Uh, if you looked at a map, I guess we're northwest of Hastings, slightly northwest of Napier, but we're inland possibly 30 kilometers, give or take. Okay, so now this wine itself, so I hope what, what that means in terms of uh, impact on wine and impact on Pinot Noir, because you might not be aware of how much Pinot Noir is actually grown in Hawke's Bay to begin with, but it's quite significant for the still wine production, some sparkling wine production as well. But these free draining, silty, gravelly soils um, create the opportunity for slightly lower vigor in the vines. But of course, you know, the weather effects will change that as well um, with the impacts of climate change. But generally speaking, once again, lower vigor because we're inland and it is relatively dry, relatively speaking, quite dry. So Pinot Noir responds very specifically to the environment in which it is in. So we've got a rain shadow effect from the beginning of the Southern Alps. We've got silty gravelly soils. We're not too close to the coast. So essentially what we are getting is um, fruit focused, um, exceptionally pure wine that has a Hawke's Bay signature. Unlike other Pinot Noir from around New Zealand, it's got its own particular signature because it's all about purity of fruit. So let me pour some of this. And this is a 2020 vintage, so it's brand new. It is the only wine that I'm showing you today that is closed under cork, all other under screw cap. The range of alcohol by volume across these Pinot Noir is probably the New Zealand average, and that is 13% through to 14 and a half. And I'll tell you which one is which as we go along. Uh, we're at 13.5% for Hawke's Bay. So that nice warmer inland climate is reflected in the alcohol by volume here, but also the ripeness of the fruit. What this gives us is super ruby core colored wines. And as soon as you put your nose in here, you have to decide, am I snuck? I, I do get that core of fruit and it really is that that black currant, almost raspberry-ish kind of fruit, lots of darker cherry characters, but underlying that is minerality. And I think one of the, the messages from this presentation for you is to look for minerality because when I start talking about it, this is gonna be related to the soil type specifically and the geographical location. Pinot Noir in New Zealand uses oak, mostly French oak. Very occasionally there might be some old American oak, but there is French oak in here. And if you close your eyes, you can imagine this gravelly, silty, slightly sandy smell in the wine. That is a reflection of this Woodthorpe Terrace. Also location and geography and the soil type is um, dictates to a degree tannin in the wine. And the kind of tannins that we get here are what I think are slightly larger tannins. They're not super fine chalky soil tannins, but they're slightly larger tannins, but they give a great mouthfeel and texture to this wine, which is also a great contrast to that core of fruit that is there. Acidity is generally and across the board, New Zealand natural overall natural. There was always some kind of adjustment that goes on, right? Overall natural. And before I carry on, ba -ba -ba -bum, this is essentially de-stemmed fruit. It is plunged when the, when the juice is fermenting warm. Uh, there's quite a bit of maceration on the skins and 11 months maturation in French oak for eggs. So I think this is also a trend for New Zealand to keep aware of. We, we are spending less time in newer oak for our Pinot Noir. Right. 
So a very, very interesting wine. So just as a, as a summary, if you like, for Hawke's Bay and then moving into that Woodthorpe Terrace is that it is, there is some marine influence. We have lots of gravelly, silty soils. We have a 68% presence of gravel, sorry, 62% presence of gravels across our soils in Hawke's Bay. And you can see that, that when we talk about the gravels or the gravel soils, this is a, the effect of that rain shadow. And the Woodthorpe Terrace is this sandy loams over gravel and uh, a dedicated Pinot Noir vineyard here, single vineyard. And it represents what Hawke's Bay Pinot Noir is all about, which once again is that purity of fruit. Um, and I'm, even though I pronounce that river weirdly, the uh, Tutakudi, Tutakudi River has an effect on why this terrace was formed. And we have these sandy loam soils. Okay. So that's our first wine done. Now we're going to move on to a place called the Wairarapa. A lot of people mistakenly think that Martinborough is the wine region around Wellington, but it is one of the sub-regions. So the Wairarapa, which is part of the Greater Wellington Province, is where Martinborough is located. And this is where the story of escarpment comes from. So the next one I'm going to pour and taste with you is this one here. So this is the escarpment. And this is a 2019 vintage. So good cropping levels, very smart vintage. And one of the exciting things about the wider Dapper is its contribution to the New Zealand Pinot Noir story historically as well. So soil-wise, there's a lot going on here because there's a lot of terraced areas throughout the wider Dapper and Martinborough in itself, which is where this wine comes from. So we're really kind of zooming in on Martinborough. But Overall, so the wider upper soil types are varied. So we have what's called dark light brown to, um, sorry, light brown to dark brown soils. There are lots of silt clay combinations here, which create this sort of wonderful color effect in Pinot Noir, but allows free draining as well. When you look at a cross section of some of the Martinborough soil types, you'll see these silty brown, light brown soils mixed in with um, river stones, which are about sort of the size of my fist here. They're very, very smooth, and then they sort of taper down into much finer granules. This creates the opportunity for winemakers to capture that mineral aspect in their wine, something I love to talk about when it comes to Pinot Noir. So, further about the soils in Martinborough now that we're focusing in on the escarpment area and that is uh, alluvial gravel soil so the movement of soils because of river deposits so that alluvial effect um, which ultimately created um, the Martinborough Terrace where escarpment vineyard is situated. Now I've walked through this vineyard several times and there's this the, the river is down here then there's the first level of vineyards and then there's the big terrace up here where the other level of vineyards are. So it is unique because of those three levels that are there. The vines here are 20 plus years old, about, about 20 plus years old, very, very close planting. And Escarpment was one of the first, if not the first producer in New Zealand that did high density planting. And that is... I suppose the message from Burgundy uh, a long time ago and that what the uh, general manager, Larry McKenna, talks about, if you get to watch the video on this later on, he talks about close planting vines and, and the opportunity that that brings competition, but also to capture that mineral aspect. Um, they became certified by Agro in 2019 and Martinborough, as I alluded to before, has a very um, important role to play in the Pinot Noir story of New Zealand. Martinborough can be very windy. Um, so there's a lot of windblown material, some loose deposits there. Not too much rain. There's only 700 mils of rain a year in the Wairarapa overall.
And this, I guess this combination brings a different aromatic into the wine. So you have to consider the alluvial effect of the soils, the clay colors, the stones, the river stones, a lack of rainfall, lots of wind from time to time, high density planting gives you a wine like this escarpment. And the aromatic on this wine tells the story of the white at Apa, but Martin Barre at the same time. And there is this very, very soft, unfurling, almost gentle fruit core. But it is as powerful with its minerality as it is the fruit. Oak is something, as I alluded to before, is becoming a lesser impact in the wines here, but still an important component of Pinot Noir. So it's this wonderful, even, calm concentration of fruit and minerality, again, alluding back to that story. Um, old strawberry, red and dark cherry, different. It has, I, I guess that if you ever smell that, that, that dust along a dirt road, it's got that kind of mineral smell to it. Very complex wine. So the impact of the soil, the climate, the lack of rainfall is going to be primarily on tannins for me, purity of fruit, primarily on tannins. And these tannins are smaller. Um, they have a like a coarse silk texture to them. They're much smaller and finer. And they seem to weave in and out of the fruit profile. And then the oak comes along, which is not much at all. The alcohol by volume in this particular wine, 13.5 again. And what do we have to say? Fermented in wooden French couves, hand plunged and aged in 50% new oak for 18 months. You wouldn't know that there was that much oak in this wine because the concentration of fruit and the power that that velvet glove that this wine sits in is all driven by the fruit and the minerality. Very interesting wine. And the finish, again, I keep coming back to this mineral thing because the finish is this combination of fine mineral clay gravelly soils, which to me has the impact on that tannin effect, but it's this drier climate. It's not barren, but this drier climate that's there because of the lack of rainfall um, allows that minerality through, but gives us a nice little concentration, this buzz and vibrato of fruit, quite velvety, silky tannins, but fine. All right, so that is the Escarpment Pinot Noir 2019. I'm, I'm amazed at how much the core of fruit soaks up the oak. That's really interesting. Okay, time to move on to our third of six wines that we're trying today. And we're jumping across um, Cook Strait. No, we're not. We're jumping across <laughs> the ocean uh, between Wellington and the South Island and to a place called Nelson. And this is the Nudorf Tomswak Pinot Noir. And this is a 2019 vintage. So I showed you on the map before the um, the essentially the, the Golden Bay, the, the Tasman, which is um, Nelson as a wine region, sits at the bottom of this conical part of the ocean. And on the um, western side is the land is protected by some mountains where, you know, it stops a lot of that prevailing weather, but not all of it. And on the eastern side, we have the uh, Richmond Hills, which are essentially bordering Nelson and Marlborough. At the bottom of that cone, we've got um, 
the Nelson um, gravel plains. And up in the hills on the eastern side, we've got the Muteri or the Muteri Hills, which is where Nudorf is located. So generally speaking, in terms of soils across that region, before we sort of zoom in on the Muteri itself, um, it kind of covers the Muteri as well, but it's the deep gravelly clay soils. And you are sort of climbing up into the hill. And even when you get to the Nudorf site, you've got these deep clay gravelly soils that uh, are quite a significant part. Nudorf is a certified biogrow producer, um, as is the escarpment, if I didn't mention that before. And essentially what they're doing is they're continually building up the health of the soil, and this is having an impact on these wines. Um, uh, what is called um, kaolinitic clay, kaolinitic clay is a feature of the soil in and around this Muteri Hills area. And what that means in terms of us for tasting Pinot Noir from there is that we have to look for that slippery white clay silica kind of aromatic and taste on the palate. Because these are naturally low fertile soils. So building up that top layer for vine health is very important, but also knowing that we've got these lower fertile soils below because of its free draining effect. Uh, very, very interesting. The other geographical impact, I guess, is the marine, um, the close, the closeness to the coast, to that marine climate, we'll call it, for Nudorf. Okay. They get about 900 millimetres of rain a year. On average, a little bit more than the wider damper. So Nudorf Tom's block. One thing that we never struggle with with Pinot Noir in New Zealand, and this is evidenced really well with Nudorf, and that is ripeness, color. We're not afraid to have color in our Pinot Noir. And again, this is this wonderful ruby concentration right almost to the rim of the glass. <laughs> there it is, straight up. You, yes, you'll notice the fruit because that's a feature of Pinot Noir from New Zealand and that slightly cooler climate aspect is it's that squeaky red cherry, dark cherry character. A little bit of raspberry again, but then there's this, this silica clay mineral. It really is quite significant. Just before I taste that, let's double check this. Um, alcohol here. Again, 13.5% alcohol by volume. So when when you get that, you've got to have fruit concentration. And so sight is very important. I think the jump to the north, from the North Island to the South Island, changes the profile of these wines quite significantly because I have this slightly darker cherry spiced effect from the fruit that has got to be related to the soil and the climate and the lack of rainfall. But this rise of minerality, again, I think that's probably also related to the fact that these, this land is unique farmed uh, organically, um, but that helps promote the idea of this earthy mineral character. If you don't know what silica is, and you're interested to find out what I'm talking about, then if you taste a high mineral content, mineral water, often there is a silica taste at the finish of that. And so that might come through. If you've ever worked in the ceramics industry or work with um, clay, you'll know what silica is all about. So it's a wonderful, complex, nice concentration of fruit with this immediately underlying character of minerality, which I call silica, but there's, there is that gravelly ca clay character as well. The voice of the land comes into the wine. Delicious. Right. How this wine was made. 100% open top fermenters, quite warm. Uh, wild yeast, so natural fermentation, indigenous ferment, 
100% de-stemmed fruit, 100% French oak, and only 15%, you know, so this demonstrates that sort of downward trend of new oak, where, uh, you know, um, 10 years ago, we were looking at 35, 40, sometimes 50% new oak, but as I alluded to, the trend is down, and now we're well below 20% with this particular wine. It doesn't need that much oak, but it does need some, and it's there. Plunged two times daily, 10 months, and then uh, racked and blended uh, dry. A really um, excellent example, if you like, of um, the, the story of Nelson and Nelson Pinot Noir. Um, so Nudorf was a great leader in that regard. So summary, there's a marine aspect um, in terms of influence of climate. The Muteri Hills are protected on essentially both sides, but it's really protected mostly from on the western side. And we've got these silty, gravelly clay soils of um, various colours. Um, and the stones are not as big as you might think. So that, that silty sort of drives it down to that sort of powdery, sandy texture. And then uh, lots of sunshine. In fact, some of them the highest sunshine hours in New Zealand has an effect on this as well. So that core ripeness of fruit is influenced by the protected piece of land, the sunshine, the low rainfall, and we've got the silica mineral character in the wine. That explains Nudorf, Tom's Block, Pinot Noir 2019. Over the Richmond Hills into a place called Marlborough, which I'm sure many of you have um, had to learn about in the past. But Marlborough's presence on the Pinot Noir stage is growing in part because they're producing some really interesting still wines, but also some really incredible sparkling wines as well. And Nautilus Estate, which is the next wine that we're looking at and a slightly older vintage, is a reflection of that story of both still wine and um, the move into sparkling wine, which they did a couple of decades ago anyway. But we had to talk about Pinot Noir. So what is the Marlborough soil makeup overall? Uh, well, glacial affected soils. So the glaciers that retreated uh, over millennia, dragged and ground out these valleys, um, the southern valleys, which is where this wine comes from, the White Owl Valley in the north, um, it touches the coastline, and then we've got the Arwa tree over on the eastern side. Um, and each of these things uh, have a, a voice to play in the story of Pinot Noir and how much clay is left behind. So we've got glacial gravels for Marlborough overall. We've got these what's called alluviums, these movements of soils over time from the effect of river flows. And then the story of grey wacky, our bedrock soil, comes to the surface again for these wines and for Marlborough as a wine region. Um, there is some clay, there are you know, limestone touches the soil from time to time, and the incidence of um, biodynamics and organics are increasing as well. As you move from the west to the eastern side of Marlborough, the rain gets less. So the Wither Hills are often at the barren side of the Marlborough region. So in the southern valleys, we have sub-regions of Omarka, Fairhall, the White Hopi, the Ben Morven. And so we're really, we're just simply talking about the southern part of Marlborough. This wine is called Southern Valleys Pinot Noir and it's a 2017 vintage. And there's all sorts of things at play with Marlborough as a wine region in general. And that is the funneling effect of um, southerly winds. It's quite a cool region overall. It's cool, can be windy. And we, we, uh, it, what it does is it challenges all of the varieties that are grown. Pinot Noir is no exception. So site and location is very important. But like Nelson, there's a lot of sunshine hours in Marlborough. And this is an advantage to Pinot Noir. Um, vineyard management is critical for any wine produced in Marlborough, especially Pinot Noir. But the southern valleys with that sort of, you know, that growing incidence of clay, if you like, the weathering of soils has an impact on what these wines are all about. This is the bottle. And a 2017 vintage. I hope you get to try this. It's a fabulous wine.
So essentially the southern valleys end up having this slightly heavier clay rich soil content, which helps with the color, it helps with aromatics. As I said before, getting grapes ripe in Marlborough generally is not a problem. It's essentially the weather impacts that might bring the um, quantities up or down on any given vintage. So I think what I might do just very quickly is I'm going to pour that Nelson noodle point again just to help you differentiate between Nelson and Marlborough with these two wines. So this is Nelson and this is Marlborough. So they both have this wonderful purity of fruit, but I think that the aromatics in the Marlborough wine are a little denser and richer. I think that the voice and minerality in the Nelson wine is a little clearer, and I think that's driven by soil makeup, but the denser richness of the Marlborough wine I think is all about that clay content and the cooling effects of the climate. Those super fine tannins in the Nelson wine are a feature with that core of fruit. Marlborough wine. Um, uh, for me, it has a more mid palate and back palate effect, and it grows this way and a little bit this way as well. So it grows this way on my palate. The tannins are, are, are bigger and bolder. The wine overall is denser and richer, but mouthfeel, I think, is a really important part of wines from the southern valleys. So you have to factor in clay, gravel, lower rainfall, um, very cool climates, but lots of sunshine. So yes, we've got fruit and we've got these, th this cherry, crunchy red cherry, raspberry, um, a mix of sort of red currants, maybe some black currant in here. Okay. In terms of what is all this combination given um, in terms of the voice of minerality in this wine? And I think it's, I, I guess it's clear in that you, you're not going to mistake the fruit content here and that, that darker black currant, um, crunchy dark red cherry flavors that are there. But I think what's different in this wine from, say, the one from Nelson is that we're starting to get the slightly savory tone through the wine. So Southern Valley's savory tone is, is now present here. The tannins are obvious, great mix of fruit tannins and wood tannins in here as well. So the effect of winemaking and um, it is clear. Um, we haven't talked about clones at all here, but this wine does talk about lots of clones. 114, 115, clone for the Dijon clone five, six, six, seven, 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 and the, the local Abel clone. Um, so this is a clonal expression, perhaps more than I've talked about before, but we have multiple clones and of Penelmire in New Zealand, um, most of which I've just uh, detailed for you there. There are a few more, of course. And what else do I want to tell you about this one? Grey wacky stones river stone flavors is a scene that runs under it and that slight savory thing that I was talking about before I think that's a feature of these southern clays um, wines um, and Nautilus encapsulates that quite nicely uh, bone dry grapes were fermented with indigenous yeasts in open top fermenters after a six to eight day cold soak um, all sorts of different um, techniques to um, draw on natural flavors here and French oak. So that is the Nautilus Pinot Noir. Hopefully that Southern Valley's effect is, 
uh, I've explained that okay for you and, and what you should expect in that wine. So that bigger tannin, slightly drying, more drying effect, but that savory tone that's there. Glacial soils, cooler, southerly air flows. It can be very hot, but quite dry and cool. So very hot at times, but those southerly winds change that diurnal effect of, um, quite dramatically, which what makes Melbourne a, a fabulous wine growing region of New Zealand is that diurnal effect. A growing incidence of biodynamic and organic farming as well is there. Second to last wine is from a producer called Pegasus Bay. And the Donaldson family really do have a great story for you to discover and what goes on in Northern Canterbury. So if you may have seen that map that I showed you before, uh, there's Banks Peninsula out on the uh, eastern side and the northern part of the Banks, of, north of the Banks Peninsula is the Waipada area which sounds awfully similar to the Wairarapa in the North Island, but Waipata area. And this is where soils do change again. I mentioned that limestone component from before, uh, which is quite prevalent in certain parts. Uh, historically, the vineyards were more towards the south of Banks Peninsula, but now, um, you know, in the last 40 years, really it is Amberley, Waipara, and north of Waipara again. So we've got a wine that is very, very different and really does capture what the soils are all about, the climate is all about. But I think the further south we get in New Zealand with soils and Pinot Noir aspect and location become dramatically more important. I mean, it's always more important, but dramatically so in this case. So what are the soils like in Canterbury, North Canterbury, Wipra, where this wine comes from? So essentially we're shifting and, and the words are changing, sandstone, siltstone, glacial effect as well. It's quite a flat area overall, by the way, but the rain shadow effect from the Southern Alps keeps it dry. Um, there's a thick layer of loose or low S, however you pronounce it, loose, under which you have the core of the soils and what effect they bring. Limestone is 43% of the Canterbury soils overall, more towards the north. So site once again becomes an important component. The limestone is a minor part of the Pegasus base story because essentially their vineyard is made up of what's called the glass nevin gravels. Glasnevin gravels, and that is all about this particular site, right? And what that gives us is gravels, but it gives us grey wacky again, and we're starting to see the beginnings of uh, the early part of schistous soils, without using the word schistous, but the early parts of that. Um, lots of silts, windblown silts, and what we call loams as well. So all the stuff that's sort of piled on over time. And when you get to visit this area, especially around that Pegasus Bay, you'll notice the flat land that it has and the hills in the distance. But it can be incredibly warm, lots and lots of sunshine hours again, and a very even climate overall. It can snow in the winter. It can be very hot in the summer. Rainfall is all about the vintage, but is generally quite low. So hopefully that explains it. Um, essentially, the glasnevin and gravels gives us quite low fertile soils. And from a winemaking or a wine growing perspective, that is great for controlling vigor in vines. But the climate change, who knows? What it also gives in terms of its geography is the diurnal shifts, that hot, cold change in the evening for a variety like Pinot Noir. <clears throat> it is an immediate effect. If I was comparing uh, Nelson to Marlborough to Canterbury, the seam of minerality in this wine is significant. It is a real change. 
In fact, I would argue that the smell of the mineral because of these soils is first, with fruit a very close second because there's so much going on on the nose. It has to be driven by location. Soil. Yeah, and the fruit is a very close second and, the, and then there's oak and this wine, but what is the smell of the soil and the wine? And I think it is this fine gravelly, what, and what I call it almost the chalky effect of soil. Yeah, clay, gravel, chalk. And then this fruit comes in and then I get this sort of sweet spicy hit of oak. I didn't mention color, this is a slightly lighter hued wine, a little harder to see probably for you. But the color of this wine is a little bit lighter. It's translucent, I can see through it. But the aromatics and the palate texture are phenomenal. Yes, I didn't mention one geographical component of this and this is the Tebiot Dale range, which creates a slight, a slight rain shadow effect, but it does help moderate the climate. Um, the other component about this wine, which I think is very important, is these vines are about 40 years old, give or take, of course. In terms of winemaking, approximately 40% of the grapes were put at the bottom of the fermentation vats as whole bunches, with the balance being distemmed on top, retaining as many whole berries as possible, and so on and so on. So, um, capturing the essence of Pinot Noir through a mixture of whole bunch and destemmed fruit is part of the story of this wine. But vine age and the happiness, the, the, the comfortable place that vines have with their soil are very important in evidence here. Yeah, again, it's, and as this wine opens up in the glass, it, you know, it's more of that clay chalky mineral smell and then the fruit comes in and then the oak. I think what um, Matt does in terms of his winemaking here is that he really understands tannin management because there is this fine savoriness to this wine, which I think is important, but it doesn't hold back the minerality and the core of fruit. So I, I, I'm confident in saying that it is a true reflection of the combination of site, climate, vine age, and soil. So just in summary of this wine, you know, glacially affected um, sandstone soils, uh, the glass nevin gravels, which is where this Pegasus Bay vineyard site is um, predominated by, grey wacky again, the bedrock of New Zealand, you know, get that, that, that slightly gravelly effect, I guess, on the palate as well. Great tannin structure, lots and lots of natural acidity, and this wine is balanced but very young and I suppose that's something I forgot to mention really yet about the long-term effects of cellaring of New Zealand Pinot Noir is put it in the cellar is all I'm saying you know if you give these wines at least five years to settle in and develop um, they will reward you. So that is the Pegasus Bay Pinot Noir. I think part of the story of Canterbury wines as well now that I've just sort of uh, had that final sip is mouthfeel and you can feel the tannin, you can feel the fruit, you can feel the soil. There's even a slight saltiness to this wine, which is interesting. Okay, that map behind me on the wall is the sub-region of Bannockburn and that blue line that you can see that does this is the Kawaro River. And this is central Otago, our most southerly wine region, our most inland wine region and our region with the most elevation. And we're touching on a very, very interesting and important producer of the Bannockburn called Carrick. See the word organic there, which is part of the growing movement or of organically farmed and produced wines in that region. It's Pinot Noir 2018. So not the oldest wine, but it is the one with the most alcohol. And I think that that's important as part of the story of Central Otago is that ignore the alcohol look at the wine this is 14.5 percent but when i taste this wine you'll be amazed at um or i hope you'll be amazed at what comes through and it's not the alcohol 
in, in my humble opinion. So we've now moved into very, very old soils. We are starting to see the effects of um, age, inland, um, this silty, this, this compact sandstone, these silty soils, the impact of man, I guess, from you know gold mining days, yeah, give, give or take, probably less than more. Again, a, a, um, a, a dramatic change in the soil type. And you'll see that when you land in Queenstown and drive through the Kawaro Gorge into the Cromwell Basin, which is essentially what we're dealing with here, is the Cromwell Basin with Bannockburn to the south of the actual um, basin area itself. It's a very warm area. And what you'll see is schist, schist soils. They, they just like stab themselves out of the ground as a very, very hard soil. When you get into the Bannockburn area, however, yes, you'll see some of that schist effect, but you might actually end up seeing more pink and white quartz deposits. And essentially, um, um, soils that are a lot finer and sandier, finer, sandier, siltier soils, almost to the point of sand, pure sand, but not quite, right? So deep, silty loams. And if you look at that map behind me, you can see you know, part of that is dictated by what that river has done over millennia and how barren and almost desert-like the land is here. So the way to control vine vigour is to build up the health of the soil. So wines from Bannockburn are from a warmer climate generally speaking from central Otago we're dealing with something that is warmer overall some say Bannockburn is the warmest eh, give or take right depends um, but essentially we've got this land that is 98 percent driven by aspect so if you want to plant a vineyard in central Otago you have to choose not only the right site but the right aspect to capture the sun to know what the soil effect is. The sunshine hours from one vintage to another can be dramatic, can be quite dramatic. But generally speaking, we're over a thousand sunshine hours on, on average in terms of vintages, some you know into the 12, 1300s, uh, but as low as 980 sunshine hours. So you can see you know, that dramatic landscape of central Otago, the, dr the drama, the individual drama of Bannockburn is going to be reflected in these wines. Very, very free draining, which is an advantage. I guess the other thing I forgot to mention is that the Carrick Vineyard is above, not too far above the Kawaro River. And there's the Bannockburn Inlet, which kind of comes very, very close. So the moderating effects of this river are important. The vortex of airflow movement above this area is also important as well. Some of the most amazing cloud formations you'll find, and that's vortex driven. So there is a lot of impact on these wines based on purely location aspect, these silty, sandy soils and this bedrock of schist. Very old. So what does that mean in, the, in terms of Carrick wine? Yes, it's organically grown, organ organically farmed, and that's important. But a little bit like that Pegasus Bay wine, we have this intriguing and complexing effect, almost beguiling effect of soil first. So they're gonna smell different. Dried herb, just wild dried herb that grows everywhere I think has echoed itself in a lot of these wines, especially this one. You can imagine a rugged countryside can be, record, can be recorded in a wine like this. 
but there's a softness, there's an elegance, there's a complexity as well. Suppose if you took the makeup off somebody that is beautiful and you showed their raw organic features, that is what this wine is like. You know there's beauty there, but you're seeing it exposed in a different way. Cherry, strawberry, dried raspberry, wild thyme, wild flowers. That is the effect of this environment, I think. Mouthfeel and texture. I think that's what these wines are all about because, yes, it's dry. It's warmed up, so I'm feeling the effects of that alcohol, but I don't think that that is something that is driving this wine. What's driving this wine is this very, very fine but hard granular feel, slightly savoury, nice core of fruit. And I, because I've walked this vineyard, I've stood on this site and I've smelled the air, I'm seeing that in this wine. So the effect of these silty, sandy soils, the Kawaro River, the gorge itself, um, this aspect that is critical to these wines, and clearly the health of the soil, is all showing in a wine like this. Great acid lines, by the way. You know, it's still a naturally cool climate at the end of the day, so acid is natural and wonderful. Yeah, really, really interesting. So we have come to the end of the session. And I hope that you have learned a little bit more about New Zealand, um, its overall um, complexities in terms of soil change from Hawke's Bay right down through to central Otago, the effects of rain shadow, how the soils are old, but not as old as elsewhere in the world, and how much this is driving our viticulture at the moment. Pen and Noir, no, heart, no holds barred is a very, very important variety for New Zealand. And a lot of people talk about New Zealand's future in terms of Pinot Noir and a couple of other varieties uh, on the backbone of our flagship styles. Um, I hope you've learned something. My name is Cameron Douglas. I'm a master sommelier, uh, resident in West Auckland, New Zealand. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Visit my website, please, if you want to reach out to me and ask me some questions. I've, I've just got so much information to share with you. That, that would be my pleasure. CamDouglasMS.com. Send me an email. So I'm done. Kia kaha. Be well. Look after your family and friends. And we'll see you again soon.